And the disciples came unto him privately saying, why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, some things come only by prayer and fasting. Welcome to Q&A with Elder Randy Skeet on The Word Inspired. Today, we are discussing prayer and fasting. I am your host, Denisha McCurchin. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we come before you humbly and gratefully praising your name because you have invited us into your presence. Thank you, dear Lord, for the opportunity to even learn how to commune with you during this session. We ask that you would forgive us of our sins and put your words into the mouth of your manservant, Elder Randy Skeet. I pray that your Holy Spirit would reign and your people will be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, our special guest for today is a part of the Word Inspired family. Uh, he is an ardent preacher of the gospel and has traveled all over the world proclaiming the message of salvation. Uh, so last week, I believe, I had the opportunity to finally meet our speaker in person. And in addition to being a husband, in addition to being an evangelist, he is a nice man. Please help me welcome Elder Randy Heat. Thank you very much, my good sister. It was very nice to see you. It was entirely my pleasure to meet you and your lovely mother uh, last week in New York. It was a great joy. I enjoyed that weekend very, very much. But here we are today. God has brought us this far. And I'm ready and willing as far as God empowers me to try to answer these questions with as much biblical accuracy as lies in my power. And so I thank you again for allowing me to be part of what I consider to be uh, a blessed spirit endorsed ministry. I really believe that. So I thank you. And I hope that all those listening, wherever they are, will be blessed by the information we glean from the word of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elder Skeet, for your yeah. willing service and for accepting this call. Thank you. So let us begin with our first question, which actually comes in two parts or has two parts. The first question, first part of the question is, what is prayer? And the second arm is, what are the different types of prayer? The first question is very, very simple. Prayer is simply talking to God and with God. Notice I said to God and with God. True prayer isn't a one directional experience. It is a conversation where you speak and you listen and God speaks. So prayer is conversation with God. For some of the Adventists, the classical definition is found in uh, Steps of Christ, page 93, paragraph two. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Very often people tell me, we talk and they say, I cannot talk to God, I cannot pray, and they're telling me this. And I say to them, what you just told me, you should have just told God. And you would be praying to God. Just tell God precisely what you told me. Tell him, I cannot pray. Tell him, I cannot find the words. Tell him, I suffer mental blocks. Tell him, my mind wonders. You will be praying, even as you say you cannot pray. By talking to God, you are praying. And so prayer is conversation with God. And it is not one directional it goes in two directions. Now, the different kinds of prayer, I believe, uh, was the second part of the question. There's a prayer of thanksgiving, a prayer of praise, Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. That's a psalm of thanksgiving, a psalm of praise. There is a prayer of confession of sin, Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. We have a prayer of 
confession. We may have a prayer of intercession where one person prays for somebody else. And so there are various classifications or kinds of prayers, but it does not change the essential fact that it is always a conversation between God and the person who is praying. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elder Skeet, for mm -hmm. breaking that down for us. Now that we have defined uh, the first part of our topic, let's now move on to fasting. Mm -hmm. What is fasting? That's one. And then what are ways we can fast? Right. Fasting is the voluntary and intentional act of denying usually food to the, to the body. You intentionally deny yourself food. Uh, most fastings in the Bible, if not all, are associated with food, but there are other ways to fast. But let me repeat what I said earlier. Fasting is the voluntary denial of food to the body or of some other thing that the person considers essential or something that's not essential, but maybe destructive to the spiritual life. You deny yourself that for a while. Of course, if it's destructive, you should deny it forever. But that's another story. So fasting is voluntarily saying no, most often to food for a spiritual purpose. But even atheistic researchers will tell you that from fasting from time to time has physical, physiological health benefit that may have nothing to do with church or spirituality. And I say again, researchers with no connection with God have discovered that intermittent fasting from time to time, giving the body time to rest, has tremendous physical, physiological benefits. Now, talking about the different ways of fasting, well, there's one fundamental way, which is denial. It may be, what are the things from which I can fast? One, most common, food. Two, it may be a particular pleasure. Your pleasure might be television. If I was uh, conducting a, a crusade at a church many, many years ago, and I asked the congregation to fast for a week. Let them choose the thing from which they would fast, whether food or uh, television or whatever. And they, many of them chose to deny themselves food. Others chose to deny themselves television. And the, uh, the testimonies are quite interesting. In that week, one lady lost five pounds and she was very delighted. She chose to fast from food. A couple was traveling, they could not attend physically, but they joined in the fast. And because they were on the road, every time they stopped in a hotel, they chose not to turn the television on, rather to read the Bible and the writings of Ellen White. And they said they were greatly blessed because they discovered new things about scripture and Ellen White. And a little child chose to fast from chocolate. And after two days, she says she tried, but she failed. It was so hard and the church was so touched, she said she would try again. And so fasting, is uh, the, the voluntary denial of something we love that we crave, the, the, the absence of which would cause us suffering. So fasting should, should cause, let me use the word carefully, some suffering. What I mean by suffering, you want this thing very badly, but you say no. And the, the flesh, the body yearns for it, or the mind yearns for it, but you keep saying no. So in that sense, there is a suffering. And we need to experience that as part of spiritual growth. And so let me repeat, fasting is the voluntary denial of some pleasure to a person and there are various things from which we can fast. Number one is usually food. The longest I have personally fasted was three days and I literally thought I would die. I said, Jesus, I do not know how you did it for 40 days. I just don't know. I did it three days and I was so glad when I saw some food at the end of those three days. But fasting is absolutely essential for spiritual growth. And so I'm so glad that your title combines fasting and praying. Fasting is a spiritual discipline from the biblical perspective. All right, next question or powerful. some comment. Powerful, no, powerful Elder, Elder Skeet. Uh, I really like how you also differentiated uh, what scholars may, uh, how can I say, see as benefits of fasting to the spiritual application that we mm -hmm. need um, when, uh, when we are fasting. And I'll just perhaps pose this question. I had a put up on the YouTube community page. I'm gonna ask some of 
you know, my followers, how do you fast? I know you mentioned various types of fasting, like the young lady that fasted from chocolate, another one fasted, mm -hmm. fasted from television. Mm -hmm. But she said sometimes she doesn't know she's doing it right. Okay. I mean, is there a certain sensation that we should expect? How do we know that we're even fasting correctly? Well, there's no sensation other than a sense of painful denial. There's no real sensation. If you're not accustomed to fasting, let's say from food, there's some Adventists or some people who fast one day a week. Some fast uh, more than once a week, but they do it half a day on those days. If you're not accustomed to fasting from food, don't jump into a seven day fast. You see, the Lord doesn't need you know, self-destruction. That's not what he wants. He wants spiritual growth and physical benefit. So don't jump precipitously into something to which your system is not accustomed. If you're not accustomed fasting from food, then move into it slowly, gradually. You may decide to fast from breakfast, or you may decide to fast from lunch, or from supper, or whatever. Or you may decide to fast just the first half of the day, or the second half of the day, and go to bed on an empty stomach. You do it gradually, and then you can move on to an entire day. A day and a half is entirely up to you. But God, God's requirements of us never sets aside common sense. If you've never done this thing before, move into it, gradually, or seek uh, guidance from someone who has fasted as a part of that person's life. Jesus Christ, when he fasted, was surely sustained specifically by the Father, as was Moses, who fasted 40 days and 40 nights. By the way, I believe Moses did it twice. But if you're not accustomed, do it gradually. Now, if it's television, you may also need to do that gradually, because food is not the only thing that we crave. We crave pleasures. We crave things that make us feel good, whether it's drugs or alcohol or cigarettes or whatever. And if television makes you feel good just watching it, and you want to fast from that, don't say I'll fast for two weeks at one shot, because you'll fall. Most likely you'll fall, and failing has no benefits. So what I would recommend, you do it gradually as well. I will not watch TV for half a day, or I will not watch it for the second half of the day. And if you can go through that, then maybe two days or maybe an entire week. You may come to the place where you don't watch it at all because it really has very little spiritual benefit. And so you move gradually, you use your common sense, and you're always praying to God, guide me, guide me, guide me. The ultimate point of fasting is not to develop a sense of satisfaction. I did this. The point is to grow closer to God and to become spiritually stronger. Not to say, I did this, but to grow closer to God, to develop spiritual strength, to resist temptation. And by the way, to understand the word of God more clearly, because fasting brings about a certain clarity of mind. And then you can understand God's word much more clearly. But fasting is not that you may pat yourself on the back and say, I did it. Amen. Powerful. Elder Skeet, there are just two things I would like to extract. Mm -hmm. I'd like to extract from what you shared. One, we've got to be practical. And I think that um, process of going gradually, we can apply to other, uh, how can I say, character defects or things that we want mm -hmm. to change, mm -hmm. that we want to build. We take That's it right. step by step, making gradual adjustments so that we can reach our goal. There's mm -hmm. a practicality to Christianity. And then secondly, the purpose and I think that's the core. That's how we know when we have truly fasted is that we, we have been drawn closer to God, which is why we fast. So thank you for sharing those comments, Elder Skeet. And I'm now going to ask the next question. But let me, let me jump in quickly. Uh, you'll also experience, if you fast seriously and sincerely, a, a, a reduction in your interest in secular things. Uh, no, not all secular things are bad. By secular, I meant the things of the world that have no spiritual value. You will experience a gradual loss of interest in those worldly activities that have no spiritual value whatsoever. You know, Paul says, if he then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, and the desire for heavenly things will grow and grow. As the psalmist says, oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalm 119 verse uh, 97 or Psalm 119 verse 20, my soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgments at all time. It is a, you develop 
develop this craving for spiritual things so that you can say with Christ, I have meat to eat, you know not of. And so faithful fasting creates a hunger for more spiritual experiences, and it brings about a diminution, a reduction in our interest in the things of this world. Notice I said, all the things of this world are not bad. I mean, those secular things that have no spiritual value whatsoever. Powerful, powerful. Thank you for that, for that addendum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice word, addendum. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so here is our third question. Mm -hmm. When the disciples could not cast out the demon from the son with a dumb spirit, mm -hmm. Jesus chided with them for their faithlessness. <clears throat> then he said, this kind can come forth by nothing, but by prayer and fasting. That is mm -hmm. Mark 9, verse 29. Mm -hmm. How do we know when a situation requires prayer and fasting? Say that question again, please. How do we know when a situation requires prayer and fasting? That has to be a personal determination. One can't determine for another. You need to fast, so you need to pray. We all need to pray, and we all need from time to time to fast. But clearly, the situation of which you referred in Mark chapter 9, also in Matthew 17, and Luke chapter 9 is found in three of the Gospels, it was, it was a very critical situation. This young boy was in a very terrible state, and I'll get to that in a minute. And so, but we have to determine, do I need to fast? Do I need to pray? We always need to pray. We don't always need to fast and you cease to live, but we always need to pray. The Bible says pray without ceasing. It does not say fast without ceasing. That does not undermine the importance of fasting. But we, it's an individual choice. Do I need to fast about this or about that? But let me say this. You do not lose by applying fasting to any uh, decision-making experience you may be facing or any situation at all. You do not lose by applying fasting. It should become a way of life for you and for me. And again, I said, how often is entirely up to you? But you alone can decide, do I need to fast? Because fasting cannot be commanded by one person to another. It must be as the Spirit leads. We know it is biblical. We know Jesus did it. It's in the Old Testament, the New Testament. It is a spiritual discipline. It is significant. It brings spiritual growth. We must do it. But as to what situation requires fasting, that is a personal choice. But the more serious the issue, the more urgent it is to fast and pray. When uh, the Holy Ghost wanted Paul and Barnabas to go out on the mission, he came to the disciples in Antioch in Acts chapter 13, and he said to them, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work whereunto I have called them. Acts 13, verse 2. The Bible says, and when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. It was necessary to fast. In verse 1, they were, they were fasting, verses 1 to 2, they were fasting and praying in Antioch because that was the early beginnings of the apostolic church. So fasting was necessary because opposition was tremendous and life-threatening. And so fasting can be applied to any situation.